Good morning, DC Ranch Golfers. This is Dick Hyland, and you can see my sidekick, Dana Parrish, is with us today. Dana is our Director of Agronomy, Head Superintendent, and he's going to talk about his world, which we think is very, very important here at the club, and that's to have proper playing surfaces. And we hope, as many of you have told us, that you've enjoyed the surfaces, and we're only going to get better as the temperatures get warmer. So I'm just going to ask Dana a couple questions that you have asked me separately, and let's hear it from the Chief. So we are six feet apart. We're taking the masks off so you can listen to us, which is important for what we're trying to do as a club right now. So Dana, the course is in better shape right now and it's gonna get even better yet as the temperatures rise these next couple weeks, right? Yeah, correct. So the morning temperatures is really what we're looking for. Um, the nighttime temperatures, morning temperatures, as they creep up, the uh, Bermuda grass will stimulate and start uh, greening up and growing at that point. Okay, so Dana, um, as we get into the transition period, tell us what you're looking for. We're looking, let me start it off with this. You're looking to go from the ryegrass to Bermuda? Correct, yeah. So we're in our initial stages right now of our transition, which is lowering all the heights of cut. And I realize this year we've all been uh, a one cut uh, golf course, uh, fairway rough height is all the same. So uh, so what we're trying to do is just lower, lower down all this ryegrass and to as low as that we can get it, which is about a quarter of an inch. And that way the sunlight will expose, will get into the uh, Bermuda grass. And um, you know, that's, that's basically our first step in the transition process. Yeah, so the whole deal is we wanna have the best conditions we can year round. Year round. And so that means this transition period that's coming up, we lower the heights, right? Yep. We play at a one cut. And I should tell the folks here that when I check with the handicap committee, handicap caps haven't really gone down just because the height of cut has gone down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, correct. It's, so um, I think there's the golfers are probably seeing their balls in some areas uh, where they haven't seen before because it doesn't get caught up in the rough. So Dana, tell us about the non overseeded greens. These, this is the third year we haven't overseeded them. What's your assessment of how they're coming along? Well, my first assessment, you have to be very careful with the amount of water that you're putting down on the greens in, in, in the winter time here. Um, minute mint, uh, amounts of water at this time is what you're looking for. Uh, once you start getting a little heavy with the water, uh, they will tend to thin out a little bit and with the, the low daylight hours. Um, so that's one of the, the negative parts of it, but the positive part is they just continue to get healthier every year and you don't have to go through the transition process because they're Bermuda grass year round and we spray them with a, a green paint on a weekly basis uh, to keep the colors up and then that darker green also uh, gets more heat into the, the plant which they always they'll always grow um, throughout the whole winter not much but they do grow a little bit so dana um, when we talk about paint let's not scare these people to think that we go down to Sherwin Williams down on Franklin right and get a bucket of green paint and splash it out there. It's mostly with inside the uh, fertilizer, right? It's, Correct. it's just a pigment. Yes, it's Correct. a pigment inside um, that we put in our fertilizer applications on a weekly basis. Yes, okay. it's a and turf if, paint. And if you have more questions for Dana specifically, let either one of us know and we'll address these as we try and get these videos done almost weekly. Yes. We know it's been a couple of weeks, but here we go. So the next thing we want to touch on is is our pride of membership program and that has to do with agronomy as well where we're talking about the proper way to rake a bunker the proper way to fill a, di a divot right yep. and then we'll come come up here on the punting green and we will show them how to fix a ball mark so there are no excuses you ready the to go proper way to fix a ball mark there you go all right so let's go so many of you want to be reminded what our pride of membership program is as it relates to the agronomy and we are here in the bunker and there's a proper way to rake a bunker and an improper way to rake a bunker just so you know, according to the rules of golf right now, we are back to raking bunkers, so there shouldn't be any excuse. Now, Dana and his team, every morning, every day, comes in and rakes the bunkers, and you cultivate the sand and try and move the sand around, right? Yes, yeah, correct. Okay, so once he does that, it's our responsibility to keep them as playable as we possibly can. Uh, Sarah, working the photography or the videography this morning, Sarah, if you can get in here. What we want to make sure is that we don't have any ridges whatsoever when it comes to finishing off the raking of the bunker. You can see here that a player went in here and dragged the sand in their effort to 
try and rake the bunker, but you've got grooves all, all over the bunker, right? Then we have the player who raked it sideways, and really, as you can see, the first person at least raked them in the direction of play. The second player raked them horizontally, and if your ball gets stuck in one of these grooves, it's a very difficult shot, right? And then lastly, I'm going to show you the right way to do it. So when you've made marks in the bunker, we want to push the sand over top of where the imperfections are and work your way out of the bunker. Use a little bit of elbow grease here so that we can move the sand around, get some air in there, and so the sand can dry. So you can see that you know, the bunker doesn't have any grooves and it won't have any grooves when we're finished. And if we can get it looking a little bit like this, or a lot like this, the players behind you who might have to, have to rake their way out of the bunker, they're gonna find that it's pretty easily done. You ready? Now we're gonna go figure out how to uh, fill a divot. Okay, the second part that we're gonna talk about is how to fix a divot, but I should commend Dana on having this bunker look like a tour bunker. And that's what we want all of our bunkers to look like when you're finished raking the bunker. The second one is repairing a divot properly. You can see that the person not really too concerned about fixing it at all didn't fix it. Another player tried to fix it and created a mound and how would you like to get a lie where the ball comes to rest on this mound and you've got to hit a shot to the green. That's not the proper way to do that. So let me show you what we got. The sand and seed on, on the carts. We put a little bit in there. No bigger than the divot itself and we stand on top of it to try and get it as level and as firm as you can so that if a ball comes to rest on this divot, you can still play the shot. Okay, now we're gonna go up to the green and teach you how to fix ball marks. So Dana has done his best to have these greens be in the best putting surfaces that we can possibly have. So here you go, a player's hit a shot into this green, they left a ball mark, it's not been fixed, but we're gonna show you. So we give out these divot tools. Everyone should have one. If you don't, come on to the shop and we'll give you one. But what we're trying to do is to pinch the grass into the center, as you can see, as best we can. And then we're going to take our foot or the bottom of our putter and we are going to stamp on it so that it's a smooth lie, right? And it gets a chance to repair itself in due time, right, Dan? And that's what we're after. Yes, absolutely. And, and what I consider... I consider fixing a ball mark to be a, a privilege as you know we're we're out here enjoying the game of golf playing with our friends our family um, when we could be stuck inside doing chores or or stuck in a traffic jam somewhere so um, you know you hit your shot into the green and you make a ball mark and and let's be honest I mean not not all golfers can hit a green in regulation so um, when you when you do hit a green in regulation you know you, you should put a little pep in your step to you know have a little pride come up here and fix your ball mark and you know just prove to the other players in your groups and, and the other members that you do take pride in in the proper etiquette on the golf course um, so yeah I mean repairing a ball mark the proper way um, not only like Dick said about the divots and raking the bunker behind you it just sets up the uh, the people behind you playing for for a better playing condition and and uh, you know the talk in the 19th hole is typically about the playing surfaces on the greens and how smooth they are and how how firm how fast they are um, so yeah I mean it's just it's very important that everybody takes pride and and fixes their ball marks on the greens okay the last component of our pride and membership that I'm going to talk about today is our pace of play Everybody says that they're a fast player. No one's ever mentioned to me that they agree that they're a slow player, right? We want to play in four hours or less without exception. Whether you're playing in a tournament, whether you're playing a casual round, it doesn't matter. And I can assure you, you don't have to be a good player to be a fast player. You just have to be ready to go when it's your turn, hit your shot, and keep on moving. So we want to rake bunker smoothly. We want to fix ball marks properly. We want to make sure that our divots are repaired so that there aren't any lumps with too much sand on top or too little sand. We want to make sure that absolutely we've got this stuff going and we're going to do this in four hours. In just a moment, when we walk down, I'm going to talk to you about what's happening around the club. What's happening at the club, we first must start with this COVID-19 and all the vaccinations that have been available to many of our members so far. 
and will continue as we get in, into the summer. What we should assure you of is the medical community has not absolved us from the three critical things that the CDC requires. Social distancing of six feet or better, if we can get it. San sanitization of our hands as often as we can. And obviously the biggest one right now is the use of masks whenever we're not on the grass. So we will let you know as a club when things change to the point where maybe, maybe, maybe we can eliminate the mask, but it's not right now. So just hold on regardless of how many shots you've had. We wanna be as safe an environment, as safe a club as we can be for our members, the guests and the staff. Now let's talk about a couple of other things. So this past week we had the senior club championships and I'll do a little bit of speed talking right now if I can. Congratulations to Marilyn Jesperson. She won the ladies championship flight, shooting 154 for two rounds and that was a gross. So well done, Marilyn. The ladies super senior, Phyllis Benucci, shot 141 net, that's really nice playing. In the men's divisions, the men's super senior flight went to Jay Chudnoff with rounds of 73-76 for a 149 total. Eric Lineweber won the net senior division with two rounds totaling 134. Really nice playing, Eric. Dan Bruto won the first flight at 139. Gene Benucci didn't want to give Phyllis all the accolades in the family. He came in with a, two rounds of steady 70s for a 140 total. And now to the big boys, Howie Krohn won in a one-hole playoff with Steve Mindek after they were tied at 147. So Howie, uh, you asked me if you're the first Canadian to ever win the, Super, the uh, Senior Club Championship. Uh, I don't really know, but congratulations to you. Uh, coming up this next Saturday and Sunday, this is the club championship, and this is where the best players are defined over those two days. So on Saturday and Sunday morning, uh, we have both the ladies and the men's playing for the club championship gross. The guys will be playing from the black tees all the way back. Uh, we're gonna have individual hole locations specifically for this tournament. The gals are gonna play from the red tees again to these demanding hole locations and the winner will be defined uh, that afternoon. We should also tell you if you haven't signed up for the Desert Diamond Classic, the Roundup or the Stampede, our member members, uh, you need to do that within the next 24 hours, I believe it is, and then we get on with our process of uh, building the fields, etc., etc. So please look on 4Ts, please sign up if you haven't signed up just yet. Uh, our plan for the gals is to take as many teams as we have. I think we've got 34 or 36 as I stand here right now, but hopefully this message will be the impetus for you to make sure that you've signed up. And then for the guys, we want to get it to 48 teams per tournament. So the ladies are playing in March, the guys are playing in April, and then a, uh, another tournament in May to try and get as many people to play in this member member as we possibly can. So 48 teams, that's going to be the cutoff. If the full golf members um, haven't signed up by whatever I think it is the 29th or 28th, excuse me, then um, the sports socials will have an opportunity to fill the field only at 48 teams. So uh, we just wanted to talk to you today. We haven't talked to you in a couple of weeks. Things are looking good on the horizon from the agronomy standpoint. Dana, thanks to you and your team. And uh, we're looking to have some fun as we go through the spring and into the winter. So let's stay safe and let's have fun. Hit lots of fairways and greens. Thank you guys for your support.